Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our five minute histories videos. And today on this snowy day, I'm in South Baltimore at Filbert and Prudent Streets and we're gonna talk about the building behind me, the Curtis Bay Water Tower. And it got it started, or it got the way it looks uh, today in 1932. But let's say a few words uh, before that about Curtis Bay itself and have to say thank you to a woman, Kay Dickerson, for supplying some great information and making this video possible. So so Curtis Bay got its start as a really a small rural village um, surrounding Baltimore back in the 1830s and 40s and 50s were truck farms um, uh, supplying produce and dairy products to the growing city. Um, and to give a sense of how rural it was back then, uh, there was a hotel in the 1850s called the Walnut Spring Hotel. And the Walnut Spring Hotel catered to farmers coming, coming and going into Baltimore, as well as sort of as a resort for Baltimoreans who were looking to get away from the city. Um, incidentally, uh, it uh, had its own terrapin farm, so I'm sure the farmers and resort folks uh, were served wonderful terrapin soup back then. Um, but things started to change in the 1850s. 1853, the Patapsco Land Company, a group of land speculators, uh, uh, bought property here, intending to develop it as a deep water port. It eventually did, but not as fast as they wanted, and I don't think they made very much money, but that got the development ball rolling. By 1856, there was a bridge built across the Patapsco called the Long Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge, named after the neighborhood next door, Brooklyn, um, and, uh, and that greatly facilitated uh, commerce between Baltimore City and, uh, and Curtis Bay, Brooklyn and Curtis Bay, which were still part of Anne Arundel County back then. By the 1880s, the B&O Railroad had built its own train bridge uh, uh, for a coal depot here. And then in the 1890s, the uh, Baltimore and Curtis Railway Company uh, ran a streetcar system down here. So by the 1890s, uh, Curtis Bay was uh, squarely part of Baltimore's orbit by then um, and, uh, and started to grow tremendously with all the uh, folks coming in for the railroads and the streetcars um, and the industry. There was a wheel company, a manufacturer of, of of railroad wheels, um, as well as the Davison, uh, Davison Chemical Company, which was one of the world's uh, leading suppliers of fertilizer. A lot of guano came through here. Um, and, uh, and folks were flocking in, a lot of immigrants, a large Polish immigrant community here. We'll have to do another video. There's a wonderful building called the Polish Home Hall. We'll have to do a video on that. Um, but today, uh, Curtis Bay is a neighborhood of Baltimore. It's part of Baltimore City. It was annexed in 1919. Um, some 4,000 or so folks live here uh, of all sorts of ethnicities. Um, so back to the water tower. How did we get that? Well, in 1890, uh, the neighborhood, the, the village had grown so much that it warranted a, uh, a bigger source of clean drinking water. And there was a water tower built here. By the time of annexation in 1919, that tower had been replaced with a big iron tank. But the tank was up here on this hill and gravity, even though it didn't have stilts, gravity was still able to do its work and carry drinking water to the folks downhill in Curtis Bay. But then in 1930, along comes a gentleman named Frank O. Hader. And Hader, let me make sure I get his title right, he was the principal draftsman for the Bureau of Plans and Surveys. Um, he was a big fan of good design. And lucky for us, uh, so he was basically the chief designer for the Bureau of Public Works. And lucky for us, he was good at it and he had a big budget that he could do it with. Um, some of his other works um, that you may have uh, seen or know of, uh, the Ashburton Pumping Station, uh, another uh, waterworks project in West Baltimore, that's his. And if you've ever driven ac across the Beckleysville Road Bridge at Pretty Boy Reservoir, he designed that also. So another uh, drinking water supply uh, uh, works as well. So here in 1930, he looks at this iron tank on the hill and basically says, that's not very pretty. We can make it more beautiful. And he goes to work. Uh, he said himself that he was a lover of cathedrals, domes, and complicated buildings. And even though this is, in a, is not a cathedral, it is a dome and it is complicated, at least the masonry. Basically what Hader did was build a two foot thick masonry shell around this iron water tank. And to do it, he, uh, he uh, enlisted the help of the U.S. clay kiln. And the clay kiln made bricks of 20 different shades of browns and tans. And if you look at this, uh, you can see this wonderful pattern of dark brown 
background fading into light tan as you go up the building. Um, the masons were uh, very skilled. They came from a company called the Mullins Construction Company, and they handpicked every single brick to go in its specific place. Um, so that wonderful color pattern and, and uh, uh, other patterns are all sort of uh, done one by one, literally, as you work your way up. The creme de la creme of the building may be the, the cornice where the bricks are both chains, change in shade, but also are laid in a herringbone pattern. So really fabulous up there. Um, sadly, uh, what, during the construction, two workers died, two masons died. Let me get their names right. Otto Polo and Rico Grosso were masons uh, uh, up at the top who both fell to their death during construction. Um, but the building was completed. The shell was completed in 1932, said to be the most beautiful works uh, of uh, any in the public works department. Um, and I would venture to say maybe one of the most beautiful buildings uh, of any department, of anybody in Baltimore City. So I'm going to end by encouraging you to come out here. This uh, the, the building is, is wonderful to see in pictures on your computer screen, but even more beautiful, way more beautiful in person. And it sits in a little park right next to a school that's closed for COVID. So it is a perfect place to take a stroll on a winter's day uh, and keep socially distanced. All right, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.